Okay, um, I apologize, I'm going to talk in English because I was asked to use the English language. Um, I'm actually a scientist, but uh, science is, um, comes from the, from the Latin and it actually means knowledge. And uh, like all kids, when we are born, we have this thirst for knowledge. We always want to know, we want to learn. And I was a normal kid, and I wanted to know and learn. But at the age of 14, I still wanted to know and learn. So I wasn't really a normal kid. Um, and I now sit at my house at home, sit to my family, I want to be a scientist. My older sister said, you arrogant. You always think you know what you want. I said, OK, great. A few years later, I got my PhD in physics and told my sister, look, I'm a scientist. I said, you arrogant, you always think you're right. So I learned a good lesson. You never win an argument with your elder sister. <laughs> you might win an argument with your parents, but with your elder sister, forget it. It's a lost case. So um, I went to the last two years of uh, secondary school, and uh, I was still had to study psychology and philosophy, and I said, this is crazy. I want to be a scientist. I don't want to know any of this rubbish of philosophy. Fortunately, I had a really fantastic teacher. And after two weeks of sitting in a psychology class, I was fascinated. I said, wow, this is amazing. And suddenly I discovered that philosophy, which comes from the Greek, it means wisdom, the love of wisdom. And philosophy was fantastic. So I really changed my whole mind. I really enjoyed it. And he actually made me even more interested in science. It's because of philosophy that I really wanted to be a scientist. And I had this crazy idea that if I was a, a scientist, I could learn. I was, a, I was a young man at the, moment, at the time, as youth. And I thought, you have an atom or the elementary particles. You put the elementary particles together. If you learn how it all works, you learn how the atoms work. And then you put all the atoms together. You learn how it works, get the molecules, great. And from the molecules, you put them all together, you learn about all the solids. You learn about the human body. You learn about the brain. You learn about thoughts. I say, great, I want to be a scientist. I want to know how we think. And the best way to do it, you start from physics, from the really small particles. So I went to England to study nuclear physics. Now, what happened was that um, it only took me a few months in, uh, at the university to find out that University wasn't really going to give me what I wanted. I wanted the magic, the mystery, the mystery of knowledge. Really want to know how everything worked, the brilliance of it. I'm going to show you something. Do a little experiment, look. I'm going to do something. I'm going to pull my sleeves up so I have nothing. Look, look at this ball, right? Now, look, there's nothing. Did you see it? Now, maybe you didn't see it correctly. I'm, not, I'm going to do it again, look. I have nothing around here. What happened to your magic? Look, if you go to a theater and see David Copperfield or Louise de Matos, and he goes that, and the ball goes up and says, wow, amazing. You know you've been tricked. You know you've been had, but you find it amazing. Now, magic is around you every day. Look, there's nothing around. It comes down. Why? I say, wow. <laughs> Magic is there. You're so bored to say, oh, I've seen it every day. It doesn't matter. I said, the magic is there. Look, my son, when he was eight years old, he came home. He was at home, actually. He didn't come home. But um, at a piece of paper, and he was playing with two magnets. And he's playing around. Great, great fun. And I said, at one point, he comes and said, Dad, Dad, look at this. I have the piece of paper, I put one magnet and the other, and when I move, even with the piece of paper, it still works. And I was amazed, I said, wow, fantastic. This kid is really amazed by reality, by nature. What do you expect? Would you become a scientist? No. Unfortunately, he went to school. And school is the greatest institution to destroy magic and amazement. If you want to destroy a kid's life, send them to school. So obviously, he did what most intelligent people who want to be fascinated by the amazement of life should do. 
He went into art. He's studying drawing and painting. That's where the real magic is. You need some courage to get into science, to believe that you still get the magic. Let's, let's give another example, which is really interesting. When you talk about um, the view of boredom and the view of amazement, magic. Let's suppose that some extraterrestrial beings came to, to the Earth about four billion years ago. And they came around and saw the Earth. It's a bunch of rocks. And I said, oh, boring, it doesn't matter. Just a bunch of rocks, nothing interesting. But these extraterrestrial beings were persistent. They had a good memory. I said, let's, four billion years passed, and let's go have a look at Earth again, see what's in there. And they came around and saw people. I said, wow, amazing. The, the rocks were alive. They gave people. The rocks were peopling. In the same way that apples give apples, the rocks gave people. So the people, the rocks were alive. Fantastic. Now, you can look at this in two ways. Either a boring way, and say, well, people have conscience. So conscience is a complicated form of rocks. Or you can look at it with amazement and say, wow, look, people have conscience. They came for rocks. So rocks are a primitive form of consciousness. Wow. That's, I think, I believe this second part is the best way to look at things. It's much easier, much nicer for the view of the world to assume magic. Now, one thing that has magic is modern physics. Modern physics is where I come from, where I work, even though at the moment I work in medical imaging, so I use technology, but using basic physics. But if you look at physics, let's assume you have the hydrogen atom. All the world around us, as this brilliant film to start with actually showed, all the world around us is made of atoms. Now, you take the hydrogen atom, it's composed of one nucleus with a proton and one electron around. Now, if you imagine this ball is actually the nucleus, which is the proton, it's two centimeters wide diameter. The size of the atom for this type of nucleus would be two kilometers in diameter. Now imagine this is the nucleus. The atom is two kilometers in diameter. It's just too big. And in that two kilometers, you would have one particle, which is an electron, 1,000 times smaller than this moving around. And he moves around so fast that it seems that it's occupying all the space at the same time. So what it means is the world is full of empty space. If you look at Indian cosmology, Indian cosmology will say that the world is maya, the world is illusion. So it's all illusion. This is all some solid, but it's not really solid. It's all empty. For us, we live under illusion. So this is magic, amazing. Another amazing thing is that it's all empty. Now, modern physics, quantum mechanics has some amazing thing. There's one concept, Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics because as he said, he believed God didn't play dice with the universe. And there's one concept that said, if you believe in quantum mechanics, that means if two particles are created at the same time, after a while you measure something, and quantum mechanics said that the other one will be exactly at that point you know what happened. And said, that is not true, it's not possible. And there's a French uh, physicist who actually did the experiment. And when he did the experiment with very fancy technology, he discovered quantum mechanics is right. That means that particle in there, once you measure it, miles away, the other one will actually be affected. So even though the particle is there, they're all connected. So maybe the space is not all empty. It's within a certain level. We're all connected. Everything is connected to one another. There's a scientist, David Bohm, who has this idea that particles, matter, is what we see of the explicit reality. And implicit, there's something which connects everything that we don't really know what it is. Look. This is magic. We don't understand what happens, but this is magic. It's there. So science is there. Unfortunately, oh, there's a slide missing. Sorry, missed. That was a wrong, wrong order. Unfortunately, nowadays, we've gone into a new kind of science, the new science, the science of money. Scientists, a lot of scientists, are actually fighting for money. We actually have to get grants, get companies to, to, to subsidize us. You have to 
spend a lot of money, a lot of time looking for money. And instead of just looking at the enjoyment and the amazement and the magic of life, of science, we're actually worried about where the money is coming from. We want to get up in our careers. We want to be well known. And lots of times we sell our souls, we sell the magic to win in this economical world. So in a way, money is taking away the, a lot of the magic in science. So I think we have to go the extra mile to make an effort to keep magic within, uh, within science. And that is really important. And uh, technology is somewhat responsive for that in some way. Because uh, technology is really important. A lot technology comes from science. Science produces technology. But then technology helps to produce new science. So don't take me wrong. I work with magnetic resonance imaging in hospitals, really, really fancy equipment, very complicated technology, so I do believe in technology. But when you look at the magic of science, you have to separate. See, TED, T, is technology. Technology is important, it's fantastic. But one thing is technology, the other thing is science. Science is not technology. You see, ministers, ministry in Portugal has the Ministry of Science and Technology. There's two different things. Don't mix the two. They're different. One thing is the toys. Like, like all kids, there's two things we like as kids. One thing is to learn. We want to find out how everything works. The other thing is we want to play, and play this toys. So we grow up liking toys. We want toys, right? And uh, you know the difference between men and boys? The mean and difference between men and boys is the size of the toys, <laughs> right? So men like toys, much bigger toys. Great, fantastic. Toys are fun, but toys are toys. Toys are not reality. Don't confuse the two. Like if you give a screwdriver to a kid, the kid will get the screwdriver and try and get all the different uh, screws and see how he can use it. And he gets so attached to the screwdriver they forget that if he throws the screwdriver away and uses his fingers, he can do wonders. They got stuck with the screwdriver. We do that in science. We invented the computer, say, wow, the computer is amazing. So the brain must work like a computer. Oh, come on. The, work, the brain is a lot more complicated than a computer. So we can't just use the technology that we have to explain the world. The technology comes from science, but one thing we have to remember, Technology is always a lot behind science. Technology is produced by science. It, technology helps a lot. One of the reasons I'm here, alive, talking to you, is because I had a appendicitis a few years ago, and in extreme, I had to be, I went into surgery, I was operated, I survived, and that was due to technology. If I didn't have the technology, I wouldn't be here. So thank God I'm here. But in that sense, Technology is important, but don't confuse the two. The two things are really quite different. So what we need to do in life is, sorry, understand what is the threshold, what is the limit, where you draw the line. Here is science, here is technology. We need the balance between the two. We need to know, we need to have science, we need to be amazed by the magic of the world. There are lots of things we don't understand, we still don't know. And then on the other side we have technology which is great to produce things and give us a good standard of living. But let's think about something. We think technology is really advanced. All the technology that we have, we think about robots and everything, but technology builds. How do we build? We put one thing next to another. You put lots of things together and build something. How does nature work? It grows. Get some cell, uh, a cell and it just grows. Nowadays, there's not a single technology that actually mimics in any way that is close this concept of growing. Okay, we get a lot of science saying, yeah, we know how the green eye works because there's a gene for the green eye. I say, yeah, I don't understand. I don't actually believe that you know that. Only when you want to produce a pink eye and you know what sort of gene you want to have for that, then you really know how it works. So we're still far, far away from really understanding nature. Nature is still magic, it's still amazing. So to, f to finalize it, I don't, I've don't, I'm not asking you to go the extra mile. I only have 13 minutes. Just walk the, the, the extra 100 meters, get out into the street. Don't buy tickets to go to St. Louis de Matos 
Don't buy tickets to go and see David Copperfield. They're too expensive. Go out in the street and be amazed. The magic is there. Don't have to look anywhere else. Thank you.